Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. And in today's video, we are going to be taking a look at transpiration, which is the water loss that we see through the stomata in plants. Now, if you don't know enough about plant tissues, you're going to want to click the link above now to watch my video on plant tissues because it's going to facilitate your learning and make it much easier to understand this topic. Now, as I mentioned now, transpiration is the plant's way of essentially losing water through their stomata, which we can see here in the diagram as these small openings that we find on the underside of the leaf. Some plants have stomata on the stems as well, but for our explanations, we're going to focus on the stomata being on the leaf and how water moves from the roots up the stem and then through and out of the leaves. I'm also going to walk you through how you should explain that and what kind of questions and investigations you might have to do in class and in exams. Now, in order to have a really good understanding of transpiration, you need to be very well versed in water moving through plants and you need to be able to understand the structures that facilitate this. Now, on the left hand side, what we see is the route that water takes. And that means you actually need quite a bit of knowledge about how water moves into the roots, up a stem and then eventually out of the leaves via the stomata. Which brings me to the second picture that we see here. It is a diagram of stomata, which are the pore-like openings on the underside of leaves, which is where transpiration occurs. Now, in exams and tests, you may be asked to draw or label a stomata. And I just want to run through some of the key things about its structure. First things first, the most identifiable thing about stomata is their guard cells, which are these sort of like jelly bean shaped cells that we see over here. And what you will notice in the two pictures is that one of them is open and one of them is closed. Now, the opening that it creates is called the stoma. Please don't confuse it with the stroma. That's S T. R-O-M-A. That's uh, the filling of a chloroplast. So let's not confuse those two things. The stoma is the opening. And um, essentially, that is affected by the vacuole. And whether the vacuole is inflated or deflated will open and close these guard cells. Now, the guard cells are also really unique because they have chloroplasts in them. And they have chloroplasts in them because it needs to provide the, the um, stomata with energy in order to open and close. The next important thing that you will also notice is that they are surrounded by these other epidermal cells. And these epidermal cells are thin and they have no chloroplasts in them because they don't need to. Now that we have a good understanding of the route that water is taking and the structure they are moving through, now let's actually look at what actually is happening and how to actually explain transpiration. So let's get into the route that water is taking when it is going through transpiration in the leaf in particular. Now, at this point, you should be pretty well versed in plant tissues and cells, because if you don't know the structure and their function, it's going to be really difficult to explain this. Now, in this picture here, we have a cross section through a leaf. And at this point, I also expect you to know what all of these structures do. We have the cuticle, which is a waxy layer that prevents water loss, the epidermis, which is a protective outer thin one cell layer thick. We have the palisade mesophyll, which is where the majority of photosynthesis takes place. We have the vein, which is made up of xylem and phloem, very important for what we're going to talk about now. We have the lower dermis, which is just the mirror image of the upper dermis, also for protection. We have the spongy mesophyll, which is very important for transpiration. It's the packaging tissue in the leaf. It also has lots of intercellular air spaces. And lastly, we have the stomata, which is, of course, the gateway for water and gases to leave the plant. Now, with being said of all of these structures, I'm going to walk you through how water actually diffuses out of the xylem, through the plant, and then out through the stomata. So let me give you just the basics, and then I'm going to break it down into how you should actually be explaining this. So in the vein of a leaf, water is going to move from the xylem, and it's going to move into the spongy mesophyll. 
From the spongy mesophyll, it is going to move into these intercellular air spaces that we see here. From there, it is going to then move out of the stomata into the atmosphere. So that is the route it takes. But now what I want to do is explain to you how it actually does this. So first things first, we need to start off at the source of water that is entering the leaf, which is in the xylem. So let us draw two little xylem vessels next to each other. And then sitting up against the xylem vessels, I'm going to draw some spongy mesophyll cells. And I'm going to leave a big area or an intercellular airspace that you can see here. Now, what's important to understand is that water is consistently moving through the plant via transpiration and transpiration pull. But the mechanism that is driving that is concentration gradients. And so what's happening is you are always moving from a high concentration of water inside the xylem to a low concentration inside the spongy mesophyll. And that is moving through a process which we know as diffusion, right? But more specifically, it's not just diffusion, it's osmosis, because osmosis is the movement of water, specifically. Diffusion can be anything else. It can also be gases, it can be uh, nutrients. So make sure you use the word osmosis when you talk about water moving from a high to a low. Now, as the water leaves the xylem and makes its way into the spongy mesophyll cells, it starts to turn that area inside of our spongy mesophyll also into a higher area, higher in uh, relevancy. In other words, in relation to what it was before, it's now become a little bit higher. Now, as that happens, water starts to accumulate on the surface of these cells. Now, that means that the outside of the cell is becoming a higher concentration, but these intercellular air spaces, these little pockets, are lower. Now, this is where it gets interesting. The water cannot just move through air. The only way that water can just move through air is if it evaporates. And that is why we need the little air pockets, because um, water will only evaporate if it is exposed to air and, of course, a temperature. So what happens is the water on the surface of these cells starts to evaporate into these intercellular air spaces. It becomes water vapor. And now what you end up having is water vapor collecting inside of these empty spaces. And now that in turn creates a higher pressure on the inside. So now we're not a high pressure, I beg your pardon, a higher concentration. And now that high concentration of water is going to need to leave. Because if I were to draw at the bottom here an opening, which would represent our stomata, now what you have is a higher concentration of water vapor inside these spaces and a lower concentration outside of the stomata, outside of the plant in the atmosphere. So now what you have is water evaporating and then moving out into the atmosphere where it moved to the lower um, concentration gradient. And that's essentially how transpiration works. It is a process of diffusion via osmosis as well as a process of evaporation which is when, of course, water is evaporating, turning from a liquid into a gas, moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. Now, when it comes to measuring transpiration, we also need to know how this works and what device we use. Now, the most classic device that you may see in your textbook or you've seen explained before is called a photometer. Now, a photometer is a very basic setup, and essentially there are some precautions that you need to take just to make sure that you set it up correctly. The first thing is this little leafy twig that we're going to use to test for transpiration needs to be fresh. It also, when you cut it and you want to place it into um, the photometer, you need to make sure that, number one, you cut it under water. That's because you don't want any air getting into the stem. You just want a continuous stream of water. And the other thing that you want to do is, if this represents the stem of our um, 
leafy twig, we want to make sure we cut it at an angle. This increases the surface area and it makes this experiment work a whole lot better. Another little precaution that we always take is wherever this rubber stopper is and anywhere else, like where the tap is, you want to put some Vaseline because Vaseline is water and airtight. And so basically it makes sure that nothing leaks in and affects the validity of your experiment. Now, how does a potometer work? I need you to imagine uh, that this entire setup is filled with water, as you can see. And there is no air in here other than this little air bubble over here. Now, that air bubble is an indicator of whether there's been any movement of water. Now, if transpiration is happening uh, correctly and this is working properly, essentially what should happen is the water that is in the beaker should move up through the tube past the markers, up, and then into the leafy twig, through its stem, and then out through its leaves. That's how it should work. Now, if that is working, and that is the case, then this little air bubble that we see over here should be moving over like that to the left. And often what you see in exams or tests is they also include like a ruler, and there'll be like measurements or increments that are on it. And it will tell you something like it moved this many millimeters over this many hours. And that can give you a rate at which transpiration is occurring because it's giving you a speed, um, distance and time. So you can calculate the speed if you have distance and you have time and you can calculate the rate of transpiration that's happening in a leafy twig. Now, the final thing that we need to look at is the factors that affect the rate of transpiration. So effectively, how quickly transpiration is occurring. And we're going to start off by looking at wind. Now, wind is a really interesting one because as wind increases, the rate of transpiration increases. And this is how it works. If this represents a stomata opening, the regular movement of water is always going to be a higher concentration on the inside of the leaf moving outwards to a lower concentration on the outside. Now, generally what will happen is water vapor will accumulate just outside the stomata, and slowly but surely, that can then turn this into a high concentration just outside, and that would slow it down. However, if wind comes along, it blows away all of these water vapor molecules that have accumulated on the outside, and it maintains a low pressure. Sometimes it even makes it even lower than what it was before. And so because of this blowing the water vapor away all the time, it leads to a very steep concentration gradient. Now we move on to humidity. Now what's interesting about humidity is it is the opposite of what happens in wind. And this is the reason why. Again, if we have our stomatal opening, the regular movement is from a high to a low. But as we know, humidity means that there is going to be a high concentration of water in the air on the outside of the leaf. Now that means if there is a lot of water vapor on the inside of the leaf and a lot of water vapor on the outside of the leaf, it's going to reduce the concentration gradient and it's going to slow it down. And so humidity, if you don't know, is how much water is in the air and that ultimately is what decreases transpiration as humidity increases. The next factor affecting transpiration is temperature. Now, temperature uh, is a little bit of an easier one to understand because you've got to think of it, again, like a concentration gradient. We have our stomata, and we have our high concentration of water on the inside of the leaf and a low concentration on the outside. Now, as water makes its way out of the stomatal opening, when it is really, really hot, all of the water vapor that is collecting on the outside of the leaf starts to evaporate. Now, if it evaporates, that means you maintain the concentration gradient. You maintain a high to a low. And so as temperature increases, the rate of transpiration also increases. Now, the final one, light intensity, is a little bit abstract, but if you understand the fact that light is needed for photosynthesis, 
as light intensity increases, transpiration will increase. And there's two reasons why. Number one, it does have to do with the uh, temperature, as we spoke about earlier, and we saw in this diagram over here in the yellow. If there is a lot of light, there is generally a higher temperature, so more water evaporates. But also, if there is more light, there is going to be more photosynthesis, and photosynthesis needs water. So that means more water is going to be pulled up to the leaves so that they can photosynthesize, and that water is ultimately lost through transpiration. Now, as always, I like to finish off my lessons with a terminology recap. You can use all of these words on flashcards, mind map out your ideas. It makes studying so much easier. First of all, we spoke about the xylem tissue and its importance in transporting water and how it gets from the roots to the stem and then to the leaves. We also spoke about diffusion, which is really, really important to understand in order to explain um, transpiration and how substances move from a high to a low concentration. Specifically, we need to know about osmosis, which is the movement of water. And there comes in that concentration gradient where we move from a high to a low. And that is the way in which water goes from the xylem to the spongy mesophyll and then into the intercellular air spaces and out through the stomata. The spongy mesophyll is the filling of the cell, which is where the majority of this action and transpiration takes place. And that water that moves into the spongy mesophyll is then evaporated into the intercellular air spaces. It then exits through the stomata, which are the openings or the pores in the undersides of leaves. And to measure all of this, we use a potometer. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed. And I will see you all again soon. Bye.